Hello everyone, this is going to be 5.2, the Greek city-states. Our objectives here, we're going to understand how geography influenced the Greek city-states, explain how democracy and other forms of government developed in ancient Greece, describe the influence of ancient Greek concepts related to rights and responsibilities of citizenship, identify the culture and values shared by ancient Greeks, and summarize how the Persian and Peloponnesian Wars affected Greece. All of that in one lecture. So, uh, the Greeks, if you recall, were uh, big fans of the Mycenaeans, uh, and the Mycenaeans and the Minoans and the Mesopotamians and the Egyptians, and sort of borrowed from all of them. They also built upon these foundations and created something that was uniquely their own. So, uh, in particular, the, the forms of government they had were unique for them. So, let's first look at Greek geography. Um, most of the civilizations we've looked at from China to Mesopotamia uh, and everyone in between has one thing in common is they are built on rivers. Uh, however, uh, that is not the case with ancient Greece. Greece is on a peninsula which is surrounded by three-fourths water uh, and it opened into the Mediterranean Sea. Um, however, it's very mountainous and very rocky. Um, and there's not a lot of rivers, actually. There are some creeks and things like that, but water is at a very high value in Greece because uh, it is so rocky. Most Greek city-states are in these valleys surrounded by mountains, uh, so this makes it slightly different than a lot of other places that we've looked at. Uh, and the Greeks also were not one large empire. They were not uh, one you know, unit. They were several small Greek city-states, uh, very much separated by all these mountains, which uh, made them very independent of each other. Um, oftentimes, these Greek city-states did not like each other, did not trust each other, um, and so they did not get along very well. So, here's what ancient Greece looks like, and you can see uh, that Athens is uh, in the Attica region, and Sparta, the other big uh, Greek city-state, is down south uh, along uh, what is called the Peloponnese. So, uh, also, this is a uh, map of what ancient Greece looks like, or modern Greece looks like, if it's the mountains, and you can see it is very mountainous. So, the fact, like I said, that these Greek city-states were cut off from each other by mountains and water and other things meant that they grew into very independent city-states, um, oftentimes very proud of their independence and also not very trustworthy of their uh, fellow Greek city-states. They did not trust each other. One of the only things that could really bring them together is if they were being invaded by somebody else. Uh, by the way... Um, We've talked about what a city-state is before, but just in case you need a refresher, a city-state is a city that controls the surrounding area. Uh, in Greece, that is known as a polis. Now, as Greece had a lot of large mountains and very few rivers, they depended upon trade. Um, they didn't have a lot of rivers to make uh, fertile you know, farming cities or anything like that, so a lot of the stuff that they needed, like food, was gotten by trade. Um, they were not self-sustaining. Uh, they brought in a lot of their food. Uh, the coastline also allowed for many bays where ships could harbor and trade could be done. So uh, the Greeks were big into sailing and trading. They traded wine, olive oil, marble for you know things like wheat and uh, other local delicacies. Uh, and so this is what they traveled in, by the way. This is a Greek ship called a trireme. Now... Uh, the Greeks turned with food and metal, but as we've seen, people do not trade just goods. They trade ideas along with it and philosophies and religions. Uh, they borrowed the Phoenician alphabet, for instance, to create uh, their own Greek alphabet. Um, the lack of farmable land in Greece also meant that when the population got too large, they tended to expand and they tended to take over other places. Uh, by 750 BCE, they had expanded all the way in, uh, into Egypt and into Spain. So uh, this is what the Greek alphabet looks like, and you can see how maybe they kind of borrowed it from the Phoenicians a little bit. So what does a Greek city-state look like? That is the question we're going to look at for a second. A Greek city-state is called a polis. Um, at the center of this polis is a very high hilltop. Uh, high in Greek is acro. So an acropolis is the high part of the polis. Uh, oftentimes there is a temple 
up at the very top of this polis, uh, meant to worship the god or goddess that is sort of the patron deity of that city. Uh, and in desperate times, it can also be converted into a, uh, into a fort. Now, underneath that is the Agora. The Agora is uh, an open space that has businesses, homes, and public buildings. So these are the three main parts of just about every Greek city-state is a polis, an acropolis, and an agora. So here we see the uh, Acropolis of Athens with the Temple to Athena up at the top. Now, usually the population of these cities are pretty small. Uh, they didn't get too big because, honestly, there just wasn't enough room and enough space. Um, and it was uh, mainly focused around the people who lived there and uh, who were born there, who were seen as citizens, the free residents of these areas. Uh, and the, the citizens are usually very protective. Uh, and like we said, they, they are very fiercely independent, so they don't often trust foreigners in these areas. Uh, there's also a very strong sense of community, uh, usually surrounding religion. Uh, however, different Greek city-states also had different um, levels of rights, depending on uh, how much of a citizen you were, how new a citizen you were, um, whether your parents were citizens as well. Uh, however, the one thing that tied them together was, and I'm sorry to say this yet again, the men were in charge. So during the rise of the Greek city-states, we see the new forms of government. So we have monarchies. A monarchy is where a king is in charge um, and where one person has control over the entire kingdom. Um, however, there's also a form of government that rises during this time where we see wealthy citizens um, who uh, were leaders of not just uh, the economy, but also were military leaders. Uh, they defended the polices, and eventually over time they gained a lot of power, and they ruled alongside the kings, and sometimes even they ruled uh, sort of, the, the king was sort of their puppet. This is known as an aristocracy, where the very wealthy, the landowning elite, rule in, over an area. And uh, also we see, uh, as the middle class grows, we see wealthy merchants and farmers growing in power as well, what is called an oligarchy. Um, an oligarchy is when power is held by a small group of wealthy citizens. So here are the differences and similarities between the three. Uh, it would be a good idea to take note of this one. Now, during this time, about 650 before the Common Era, iron had replaced bronze. It was a stronger metal. Um, it was also easier to make. Uh, and so the middle classes could afford these weapons, and so the middle classes would um, volunteer or be drafted into the armies of these Greek city-states, uh, often as foot soldiers. Uh, and when they attacked, they attacked in a uh, well-trained group attack called a phalanx, where they basically uh, moved as one giant unit. Um, and this sort of shared training that all these guys experienced helped to reinforce, again, the bonds of community, that they were doing this together. And it reduced class differences because now we have more and more regular Joes joining the army. So this is what a famous uh, phalanx looks like from the movie 300. Uh, however, uh, even with all these common bonds, the Greek city-states were not always similar. Uh, if we look at the two most uh, famous Greek city-states and two of the most powerful Greek city-states, we'll see that they actually were quite different, Athens and Sparta. Sparta was a military city-state. It was built around the military, and the military was what they really prided themselves on. Athens, however, was more about giving political rights to its citizens and about education and about philosophy. But here they are, here are the two big Greek city-states, Athens up north in the orange and Sparta in the southwest in the green. Now, let's first look at Sparta. Spartans were uh, in the area of Greece called Laconia. Uh, and today, if we say somebody is laconic, it means they don't talk much. That's because the Spartans were known for not talking very much. Uh, it was a city-state built on warfare. Uh, they enslaved the people that they conquered and made them into state-owned enslaved people known as helots. Uh, they mainly served as farmers, but helots were very strictly kept down, uh, very brutally kept under control because they outnumbered the free people of Sparta, so they needed to be kept in line, basically. That was the Spartan philosophy, at least. The Spartans had two kings up at the top, which made them very uh, different and interesting, is that they had 
two kings at the top of their monarchy. Uh, they also had uh, a council of elders uh, who were the advisors for the kings. Um, in this case, all free men over the age of 30 who were all citizens uh, also were part of an assembly that could approve major decisions. And so uh, this meant that they had several levels of like, you know, uh, government in this case. Uh, this assembly of citizens also elected five men to be uh, the people who ran the sort of day-to-day -day affairs of Sparta while oftentimes, because oftentimes the kings were away at war. So they had these ephors who were sort of in charge of the everyday sort of issues. Now, Spartans were very rigid in their discipline. Uh, they were uh, put into uh, military training and military barracks very early in their life where they practiced and trained and exercised. And again, it was a very strict sort of upbringing. And at 20, the men could marry, although they were still in the barracks until they were 30. And at the age of 30, they retired from the army and went on to become regular citizens. Now, women in Sparta also had a very strict upbringing, however, uh, because, partially because they were expected to bear healthy children, especially healthy male children. Um, so they were expected to exercise and strengthen their bodies. Uh, however, they were still socially below men and still had to obey the men in their lives. However, they could inherit property um, because the men were more focused on war, the women had to have some rights. Uh, also, if their husband died, they needed a place to live. Um, they often ran the family estates while their men were off at war. So they did have more rights in Sparta than like an Athenian woman would. To be a citizen of Sparta, you had to come from the original founders, known as the Dorians. Uh, they didn't take to outsiders very well. Uh, the citizens could own land, uh, and the helots, the enslaved people, farmed it. Foreigners were allowed into Sparta, but they were not very welcome, and they had very few rights, and they could easily be kicked out. And in general, there were more non-citizens than citizens, just like there are more enslaved people than non-enslaved people. That's why they were kept under very strict control by the Spartan government. Now, like I said, the Spartans were standoffish. They didn't like other Greek city-states. I mean, all Greek city-states were independent, but the Spartans were especially standoffish. Uh, they oftentimes uh, intentionally isolated themselves from the other Greek city-states. Uh, they did not allow their citizens to travel. Uh, they lived very simply, uh, which is why today, if you know, we say if you have a very Spartan house, it means you don't have a lot of luxuries in there. They also were not big on art. War was their art. Uh, the other Greeks uh, thought the Spartans were really great fighters, but they were a little too serious and a little too... Uh, dower for the other Greek city-states to sort of copy them. And in the end, uh, this inability to adapt uh, weakened the Spartans. Now, let's look at Athens. Athens was located in Attica, uh, an area north of, north of Sparta. Over time, Athens went from a monarchy where they had one king to an aristocracy, and the nobles would choose officials and judge major court cases. And as we're going to see, that's eventually going to change into what we call a democracy. Normal everyday people were upset with the power of the aristocracy. They thought these rich guys up at the very top had too much power, and normal uh, citizens of Athens felt they deserved more rights. Wealthy foreigners didn't like the fact that they were being stopped from becoming citizens of Athens. Uh, the farmers didn't like that they often lost their land when they couldn't pay their debts, and so over time, the regular citizens of, of Athens uh, gained more power. Athens became a democracy, a government where uh, the people had the right to vote on everything. Um, uh, this is, has a slightly different meaning in a ancient Athens compared to modern democracies, though, because, again, not everybody was a citizen and men were the only ones allowed to vote. Now, in 594 BCE, a man named Solon became the leader of Athens, and he used his power to, to shift and reform Athenian life. Uh, first of all, he outlawed slavery due to debt. However, he did not outlaw all slavery. Um, he freed debtors. He allowed some foreigners to become citizens. He relaxed Athens a little bit more. Uh, he also let citizens have some control over major issues. Uh, he also said he wanted to trade with other groups. This helped merchants and farmers make money off of their goods. So here is Solon, he's the one with the beard, uh, who said, Rich people without wisdom and learning are but sheep with golden fleeces. What a great simile that is. 
Now, even with all these reforms, most Athenians were not still citizens. And uh, so after Solon died, um, a lot of these reforms went away and a group of people known as tyrants took power. And tyrants would gain power by force. Um, they became dictatorial. Um, they had the support of the lower and middle classes because they promised reforms, but they had absolute power. And some tyrants were decent and fair, however, other ones were much more brutal and harsh. Now, as time went on in Athens, the more reform-minded tyrants, the ones who were a bit more fair, uh, allowed more and more men to become citizens. Um, eventually, they gave more and more wealth and power to the farmers and the merchants. Uh, one of these tyrants, a guy named Cleisthenes, created the Council of 500, where... Um, uh, there were 500 men chosen by lottery to, uh, to sort of be the voice of the people. This council of 500 made laws and passed them to the assembly. Uh, they also became a group of lawmakers, what we call a legislature, which is something that we still have in America today. Uh, all male citizens were members of this assembly uh, and were expected to participate um, However, citizens were still very much the minority at this time. So we see, even as these uh, tyrants are expanding the number of people who can vote and can participate, they are still the minority at this time. Uh, however, this is at the uh, beginnings of Athenian democracy. Athenian democracy is still very limited compared to, like, today, where most American citizens have the right to vote. Um, only citizens could vote, and remember, that's only men, only citizens could elect officials or hold office, and not everybody was a citizen. Uh, only men with two Athenian parents were citizens, and you were expected to fight uh, if called upon as well. Women were not allowed to be part of this democracy, sorry, uh, and foreigners and non-citizens also had no rights in this. And so uh, we also see that uh, Athens, while they may have uh, freed the, the debtors, uh, still had enslaved people. Uh, and it was their labor that allowed the Athenians to sort of take it easy a little bit and f uh, per participate in this government. Women were considered inferior to men in Athens. Uh, they, they were thought not to have the ability to participate politically. Uh, the place where they ha probably had the most power was religious uh, reasons. They were allowed to participate in religious ceremonies. Some became priestesses. Uh, women of wealthier families could run their households, but that was a very small minority of women. Uh, and they raised children and they prepared clothes and food. Uh, however, they were generally expected to stay uh, uh, in the home. Only lower class women could shop alone at Athens. It was considered below the upper class to go out and shop for themselves. Poor women did work outside the home basically because they had to. Uh, and they oftentimes worked alongside their husbands. Now, young girls in Athens received very little schooling, but boys could receive quite a bit, um, especially if their families could afford to send them to a good school or an academy. Uh, they learned reading and writing at a young age, but they also learned how to do things like make po uh, poetry, uh, make music. They learned how to speak in public, which is known as rhetoric. Uh, young men also were uh, expected to participate in sports and also receive military training, although the military training was not quite as um, brutal as the Spartan military training. Now, let's, let's look at forces for unity. What united these groups? Uh, the fact that they're so independent often led these troops uh, or these city-states to actually go to war against each other. However, there are some things that would unite them occasionally. First of all, their language. They all spoke Greek. They all had the same sort of uh, oral tradition of heroes. Uh, and also, they all participated in the same common festivals. Uh, festivals meant to honor the gods. Uh, they all prayed to the same gods. These are all followers of the Greek mythological deities. Now, the ancient Greeks were polytheistic. They had many gods and goddesses. Uh, and these gods and goddesses controlled many of the things like lightning and earthquakes and the oceans and the storms and everything. Uh, they lived on Mount Olympus, a mountain in northern Greece. The main god was Zeus. He was the head of the 12 most important gods in the Greek pantheon. He was the god of thunder. 
We also had gods like Ares, god of war, uh, Athena, goddess of wisdom, and Aphrodite, goddess of love, along with many, many other gods. Uh, gods were often honored with temples and with festivals, uh, especially in certain cities that sort of dedicated themselves to certain gods. Uh, and Greeks used men and women known as oracles to speak with these gods. Uh, the job of an oracle is to interpret the future. So this is Zeus sitting atop his throne, uh, and this is Mount Olympus. It's not quite clear where the gods live, but they were somewhere in there. Now, religious beliefs in uh, believing in gods and goddesses helped to unite these city-states. Um, stories like the Iliad and the Odyssey uh, led to further stories about Greek gods and goddesses. Um, and after the fall of Greece, many other gods and stories were actually taken on by the Romans. Uh, you'll notice that the Romans often had the same sorts of gods and goddesses as the Greeks did, uh, however, a little more warlike, usually a little less uh, peaceable. And they usually also change their names. We also see the Olympic Games help to unite the city-states, because every four years, uh, the city-states would gather uh, uh, around Mount Olympus and participate in athletic competitions to honor Zeus. Um, this was, uh, again, we, we see these Greek city-states are very competitive. This is a way for them to sort of vent their competitive streak without killing each other quite as much. Uh, the games were also so important that oftentimes, even if these city-states were at war, they would stop the war to go, uh, you know, wrestle for a couple of weeks. Um, they ranged from, you know, racing, excuse me, racing on foot to racing on chariots to wrestling to track and field, discus throwing, many other things. And once again, sorry, men were the only ones allowed to participate at that time, and the women were, uh, if you were married, you were not allowed to attend. Uh, these uh, games lasted until about 300 in the Common Era, um, although they were eventually outlawed when the Christians took over Greece and they, they were thought to be pagan. However, they were picked up back again in 1896. So here are some of the sports of the Olympic Games. Now, Greeks generally saw themselves as better than non-Greeks. Those who were not Greek and didn't speak Greek um, were called barbaroi, uh, nowadays translated as barbarians. Uh, some people, including John Green, say that uh, they got this name because the Greeks heard other people speaking languages that weren't Greeks, and to the Greeks it just sounded like they were talking bar, 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 bar. Uh, this included some other great civilizations. They, they, they sort of looked down their noses at the Phoenicians and the Egyptians and other great, you know, uh, empires that we've looked at. Now, let's look at the Greek wars as well. Now, the Greek city-states didn't like each other, and uh, they often went to war against each other. We'll, we'll see this with the Peloponnesian War. However, there is one thing that will unite Greeks, and that is when they are attacked by people who are not Greeks. So we see, uh, at this time period, uh, we see the Persian Empire growing, and the Persians uh, crossed the Aegean Sea and uh, started to take over Greek outposts in uh, Turkey, uh, an area called Ionia. In 499 before the Common Era, the Ionians re rebelled against the Persians, and since they were a Greek outpost, they turned to the Greeks and said, please help us. Um, and so the Greeks sent troops to assist them, and this is the beginning of the Persian War, a war between the Persians and the Greeks. So here we have some of the, uh, the big battles of the, of the Persian War um, from 499 to 479 BCE. So this was a 20-year war. Now, the Persians were able to uh, stop the Ionian rebellions, however... Um, the emperor of Persia, Darius I, was very upset that the Greeks had stood against him, and so he sent a very large army to put down and punish the Greeks. Uh, it landed at a place called Marathon in 490 BCE. Uh, amazingly, uh, even though the Athenians were greatly outnumbered, they were able to force the Persians into a retreat. Uh, and therefore the Athenian general, a guy named Themistocles, sent a runner from Marathon to Athens to give warning to the Athenians that, uh, the, uh, that the Persians might be headed their way. 
uh, and also time to build up our defenses and time to build a great navy. So interestingly, the route from Marathon to Athens is 26.2 miles. Uh, so it's almost like you had to run a marathon to get from Marathon to Athens. Hey, that's where they got the name from. Anyway, uh, in 480 BCE, the son of Darius, a guy named Xerxes, sent uh, a force of Persians against Athens. However, by this time, like I said, nothing unites the Greeks like an outsider, and so the Greek city-states had united against this Persian threat. Uh, the Persians were slowed down uh, as they were going to attack Athens by a group of about 300 Spartans who were at a place called Thermopylae, Thermopylae of the Hot Gates. Uh, and uh, these 300 Spartans gave up their lives uh, in order to buy time for the other Greek city-states to prepare. Um, this made them very uh, popular in stories. The Greeks eventually defeated the Persian Empire at a place called Salamis, uh, where they had a large naval battle, uh, and then they won again the next year. Uh, eventually, the Greeks won the Persian Wars. So here's a statue of a Spartan today at Thermopylae. If you've ever seen the movie 300, which I'm not sure if I recommend, uh, you can see the, the Battle of Thermopylae. After the Persian Wars, Athens uh, was the dominant city-state, um, and they convinced the other city-states to create an alliance where they would come together uh, and sort of band together uh, if they were ever attacked. And this became known as the Delian League, where uh, all the Greek city-states that allied with Athens uh, were part of the Delian League. Uh, the Delian League was dominated by the Athenians, uh, who used it to help create what is called the Athenian Empire. So the city-state of Athens is growing and growing and growing. Uh, and this is also the time of the age of Pericles. So, the time after the Persian Wars uh, were seen as the Golden Age for Athens. Uh, at this time, a guy named Pericles was in charge of Athens. Uh, he improved the economy, he set up governmental reforms, and he lasted from 460 to 429, which is known as the Age of Pericles. He once said, What you leave behind is not what is engraved in stone monuments, but what is woven into the lives of others. Uh, and it's easy to recognize Pericles. He's the one with the beard. So, uh, at this time, the Athenian Council of 500 would meet every day to make sure things got done. Uh, Pericles, however, believed that all male citizens should be allowed to uh, participate in the government, um, and uh, he set aside some money called a stipend to make sure that anyone could become a government official, even if they didn't have the money to campaign for it. Uh, during this time, Athens became what we call a d direct democracy, where citizens are directly involved uh, with running day-to-day -day life. All the citizens vote on everything. This uh, is different from uh, what we have in America, where we elect people to uh, vote on things for us. So, like, we the people do not vote on every single law passed by Congress. We send people to Congress to vote for us. One of the responsibilities of the Athenians was to serve on a jury. A jury is a group of people who make decisions in legal matters. Uh, today, we have 12 jurors, usually. Back then, you could have hundreds of Athenians judging you uh, guilty or not guilty. Citizens were chosen again at random, which we still use today. They also established the idea that all people should obey a uh, rule of law and that people on trial were innocent until proven guilty. These are all uh, Athenian ideas that we still see in our modern jurist uh, system. Now, if any leader was uh, seen as a threat to this direct democracy, the citizens of Athens could have a vote and vote to kick out this guy for 10 years. Uh, this is known as ostracism. Uh, it usually lasted for 10 years, at which point he could come back. But basically, they could vote to remove somebody who was seen as a threat to democracy. Um, these are pieces of uh, clay called astroikos, uh, with names written on them of people who were being voted out, who were being ostracized. Um, astroikos... Uh, is the word for Greek pottery shard, and that's where you get the word ostracized from. Now, Pericles used the wealth of Athens to rebuild after the Persian War, uh, including rebuilding the Acropolis uh, the, at the very tip-top of Athens uh, with the giant statue to the goddess Athena inside. 
Uh, Athens was big into art and drama and building during this time. Under Pericles, uh, Athens became not only the, uh, the wealthiest center, but also the cultural center of Greece. However, this built up a lot of resentment uh, from other city-states, uh, and very soon Greece split into two factions. We had the Delian League, who were Athens and their supporters, and then on the other side we had Sparta, who never really got along with Athens, uh, who formed their own league called the Peloponnesian League. Uh, uh, Sparta is in the area called Peloponnese. And in 431 BCE, these two leagues went to war uh, in what is called the Peloponnesian War, Athens versus Sparta, and it lasted about 30 years. Um, it was a civil war that involved pretty much all of Greece. So here we see the Peloponnesian War with the, uh, the green being the uh, Peloponnesians and the orange being the, uh, the Delian League. Um, but these are the two uh, groups that fought against each other at this time. Now, the Athenians were powerful. However, Sparta had a good geographical edge. Uh, they could not be attacked by sea, so the large Athenian navy couldn't get to them. Sparta also had a very powerful army, and eventually the Spartans marched on Athens um, and uh, surrounded the city. Uh, meanwhile, people were fleeing into the city who lived in the outskirts, and this caused massive overpopulation, overcrowding of the city of Athens, um, which caused a plague to sweep through Athens, which killed about a third of the population, including Pericles himself. Eventually, Sparta uh, and Persia allied to take down the, Athene the Athenians in 404 BCE. However, uh, Sparta did not completely destroy Athens, they just decided to conquer Athens. Now, the problem is this uh, Peloponnesian War ended the Golden Age of Athens. Um, Athens was still very strong culturally and financially, but it was no longer uh, the focal point as it once had been. Uh, and very quickly after this, Sparta was defeated by a city-state called Thebes, uh, which uh, led to a power struggle in Greece. And so while Greeks are fighting other Greeks and we're having these little mini civil wars, uh, eventually another group called the Macedonians decided to take advantage of this and take over Greece. And we'll take a look at this in our next section. But basically the Greeks were so busy fighting each other, they didn't realize that they needed to fight the Macedonians. <laughs> 